Hello, pre-calculus students. You can tell by how old and fat I am that I haven't made one of these videos in a very long time, and it shows. I'm going to take um, chapter six, section six on vectors. We're going to spend three days on it in class. I'm going to put all of that into one video. I'll tell you where they, well, you'll be able to see where the lecture notes start and stop for each day. So I'm going to share my screen and let's get going. <clears throat> That'll have to do for now. So a lot of uh, high school math teachers will say that a vector is a quantity that has magnitude and direction. Well, a vector is much more than that. That's not a very mathy definition. However, a quantity that has magnitude and direction can be represented with a vector, although not every vector necessarily has magnitude and direction. But for our purposes, we're gonna stick with this definition here. And a vector, we'll start it here at point P and it goes to point Q. So the vector from P to Q is called vector PQ. And you'll notice that we have this um, kind of like a ray thing uh, symbol over it. But instead of having two um, tails on it, it's just got the one. That tells you it's a vector. So when you see these parentheses, P1, P2, that means this point has coordinates 0 0.1, 0 0.2. This, co um, co this point has coordinates Q1 and Q2. The horizontal distance that this vector goes is this distance. It would be Q1 minus P1 would be from here to here. And then Q2 minus P2 would be from here to here. The magnitude of the vector, which we um, write using these kind of double absolute value signs means it's the length. So it's really just the Pythagorean theorem. It's the length of that vector. And the direction would be this angle theta. There are a number of ways to write vectors. <clears throat> Our book only uses one. I'm gonna show you a couple. Vector V has components V1 and V2. And notice it's got these sideways pointies on them. So this, when a vector is written this way, it's called ordered pair form. And when it's got the pointies, you know it's a vector. If it's got parentheses, you know it's just a point like you've always done. So <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, somebody once said, oh, we can remember this because these pointies are sideways Vs for vectors. Well, okay, that's pretty good. Now, vectors don't necessarily have to start and end at a certain place. They just have to have magnitude and direction. So here's vector V. It goes one unit in the horizontal direction and three units in the vertical direction. So you can see that it goes from zero, zero to one, three. That vector is the vector one, three. This is also vector V because it goes one unit in the horizontal and three units in the vertical. So it doesn't have to start at the origin. It can start anywhere, and it can still just go one unit in the horizontal direction, three units in the vertical direction. Negative V, it's going to go one unit to the left and three units down. <clears throat> if the magnitude of a vector is one, then that vector is called a unit vector. If the magnitude of a vector is zero, it's called the zero vector. And if two vectors are equal to each other, then they have the same magnitude and direction. Now I could call this one vector V and this one vector W, and V and W would be equal because they both have the same magnitude and direction. They both have the same horizontal component. And they both have the same vertical component.
if we want to add, there are ways we, a couple of ways we can add vectors. We can add them algebraically or geometrically. Let's do geometrically first. Here's vector V going up and to the right, and here's vector W going straight up. V plus W, if I start here, there's vector V. Notice it's equal to this V. And then we do, when we add vectors like this, we do what's called tip to tail. So here's the tip of this one where V ends, W starts, and now we put W on top of it. So there's V, there's W. This green vector here is V plus W, and it's called the resultant. It's the result you get when you add two vectors. Now let's just say that vector V happens to be two right and two up. And W just has to, happens to be zero right and one up. Then what, what is this green vector if we add them together? Well, we add their horizontal parts. We add their vertical parts. And that's the green resultant vector. We went two units to the right. We went two plus one is three units up. So here's vector V, here's vector W, here's vector U. Let's find out what V plus W minus 2U is. Well, here's vector V. I start with V. Then tip to tail, I add W. Now U goes down and to the right, which means negative U goes up and to the left. It's just the opposite. So there's a U, there's a U, so there's my minus 2U. So the resultant is we start where we started and we end where we ended. This green vector is V plus W minus 2U. And if we were to do it algebraically, and I've noticed I've written vector V with its components, horizontal and vertical, same with W, same with U. The horizontal component of the resultant would be V1 plus W1 minus 2U1. And the vertical component would be V2 plus W2 minus 2U2. Now let's see. All righty, it took me a moment, but I was able to get this applet going. So here's vector A. Oops, just need to drag an A over here. There's A. You know, we can make A a little bit longer if we want. Here's vector B. I'll make B, B look like this. And vector C will make C look like that. So you can see that vector A here. It goes 10 right and 10 up, or I'm sorry, 10 right and 13 up. Has that magnitude and that direction in degrees. Vector B goes 7 right and 1 up. There's its magnitude and angle in degrees. Vector C goes 4 left and 4 down. And uh, that magnitude, now why they shows negative 135 degrees instead of 225, I don't know, whatever. So here's A plus B plus C. And, oh, heck, where is it? No vector selected. Okay. Hmm. All right, I had to check something with the quickness. When we hit sum, there's vector S, and you'll see that vector S, if we move it, it starts where A started and it ends where C ended. So vector S is the sum of A plus B plus C.
And if we break the, each of those vectors up into horizontal and vertical components, you can see that vector A goes this far horizontal, this far vertical, B goes this far horizontal, this far vertical, and C goes this far horizontal, this far vertical. So when we get the sum, you go this plus this minus this gave us this horizontal distance and this vertical distance plus this vertical distance minus this vertical distance gave us this vertical distance. So that's the little PHET applet for um, vector addition. Let's do some more with um, my notes. <clears throat> So here's vector V is three, seven. Its magnitude is the square root of A squared plus B squared. So it's got a magnitude of root 58 and it's got a direction of 66.8 degrees. Now, if I have vector W that has a magnitude of 10 and a direction of 40 degrees, this is vector W and we can easily um, figure out what its horizontal and vertical components are. The horizontal part would be 10 times the cosine of 40 degrees. The vertical part would be 10 times the sine of 40 degrees. So vector addition, as I said previously, you add all the horizontal directions together and you get the horizontal direction of, or the horizontal dimension of the resultant. And then you add all the vertical dimensions together and you'll get the vertical dimension of the resultant. If you take a vector and multiply it by a scalar, you multiply each of those components by the scalar. Here's vector V. It's made up of a horizontal component of V1, a vertical component of V2. If I wanted 2V, well, there's V plus V is 2V. You can see it's V1 plus V1 or 2V1 v2 plus v2 or 2v2. So multiplying a vector times a scalar, you multiply each component of the vector by that scalar. Now, this is the way our book writes vectors. They make use of these special vectors. This is vector i. I make the i with a little tail and not a dot, but you put a vector over it, that's vector i. And vector j, without a dot, just the vector symbol over it. Those are special vectors. And they are unit vectors. You can see they're one unit long. Vector i is a vector one unit in the x direction. Vector j is a unit vector in the y direction. So another way to write the vector 5, 3, is five times i plus three times j, or five i plus three j. By the way, i, j, and k, k would be if we had something in the z direction. i, j, and k, are those are standard. Everybody in the math world uses those for unit vectors. And sometimes it's, you'll, you'll find cases where sometimes it's better to write it like this. Sometimes it's better to write it like this. All right, that was a, my first um, lesson. I'm gonna pause the video, get my notes ready, and then we'll do the second one. And I'm back. So here we have unit vectors. Unit vectors, again, are vectors that are one unit long. A unit vector is if you take a vector and divide it by its magnitude, then if it's five units long and you divide it by five, now it'll be one unit long. That would be a unit vector. Here's the vector 2, 1. It has a magnitude of root 5. So if I take that vector and divide it by root 5, just multiply that through, this is the unit vector that's in the same direction as this one. It's just 1 over root 5 times as long. 
To show that it's a unit vector, I'll square this term, square this term, add them up, and sure enough, it does add up to one. So this is how we can get a unit vector in, in the same direction as this vector V. And earlier, I introduced you to the vectors I and J, and, K, and now K. If we only are working in two dimensions, we only need I and J. But if we're working in three dimensions, we need I, J, and K. K is obviously a unit vector in the Z direction. And again, we can write um, vectors using I, J, and K. If vector U is two units in the X direction, it's two times I, or it's the vector two comma zero. If vector V is three, four, you can also write that as three I plus four J, and your resultant vector would be vector V. Now, the very first uh, picture I said, um, the vector from P to Q, you take the Q coordinates minus the P coordinates. Here's how you can remember that. Here we are at the Capitol building in downtown Sacramento, elevation 50 feet. Then we go all the way up over Echo Summit down to Lake Tahoe, elevation about 5,000 feet. If I'm going from Sacramento to Lake Tahoe, do I do 50 minus 5,000 to get my elevation change? No, I do where I ended minus where I started. So same with vectors. <clears throat> we started at the point negative two, six, and we ended at the point negative eight, three. So it's, negative eight minus negative two, three minus six. So this vector from here to here is the vector negative six, negative three, which is the same as negative six I minus three J. If vector U is a unit vector, then you can see that its coordinates will be, or its components will be cosine of theta times i plus sine theta times j. Because uh, that will always give us points on a unit circle. The slope of the line is the same as the tangent of theta, which is sine over cosine. So that's the um, slope. So if vector u is 3i plus 3j, you know that you could go 3 divided by 3 is 1. The arctangent of 1 is 45 degrees. That's its direction. 3i minus 4j, we'd go over 3, down 4. When you do the arctangent, you'd get negative 53.1 degrees. But we normally like our angles to be in the first revolution. So I got a coterminal angle for that. Got to watch the time. It's almost time for class to start. All right. You've all heard about an inclined plane. You probably learned about that in elementary school. And the nice thing about an inclined plane is you trade um, essentially weight for distance. If you had to lift this box up, you, uh, it takes a long, you know, it takes a lot of effort to lift that box up. But if you put it on an inclined plane, you don't have to exert as much effort. You have to exert the effort over a longer distance, but it will still be easier. So I put the box in a wagon because I want there to be no friction. And you know the wheels of the wagon will be about as frictionless as we're gonna get. And let's say that it weighs 100 pounds. Well, the 100 pounds acts as a vector going straight down. And we can break that up into two vectors, one perpendicular to the ramp and one parallel to the ramp. Because if I'm pulling the wagon up, 
and I'm pulling it up the ramp, I don't really care what this is because that's not acting on the wagon in a way that's going to push it up or down the ramp. All I have to worry about is this vector and I have to counteract this vector. So you can see that there's a, I could break this vector up into this vertical, well, we call it vertical, but perpendicular to the ramp, parallel to the ramp, and they are at right angles to each other. Okay, how can I find this? If we zoom in right up here, if this is theta, and this is 90 degrees, then this angle is 90 minus theta, as I've written over here. Well, if this is perpendicular to the ramp, then this has got to be a right angle. And if the and if this is 90 minus theta, then this angle in here has to be 90 minus theta, which means this angle up here has to be theta, the same theta. So now I know that if theta is 20 degrees, this ramp is at an angle of 20 degrees, and this is weighing 100 pounds, then this Y component that I'll call it is 100 sine 20 degrees. I'd only have to pull with a force of 34.2 pounds to get that 100 pound weight up the ramp. One more pause. I can't figure out where to pause the darn thing now. What am I doing wrong? Oh, there it is. And lastly, they do some weird things in this book. So if you look on page 795, number 71, they're giving you some directions. And one direction is north 72 degrees east. Uh, that means if you go north and then you pivot 72 degrees east, you can see you're really heading in a direction of 18 degrees. Because we went north, then we pivoted 17 to 72 degrees. This is north 72 degrees east. There was also south 56 degrees east. Well, we went south and we pivoted 56 degrees east. That's 270 degrees of south. And then going in the positive direction, another 56 degrees. That's a direction of 326 degrees. That's how you read these types of directions in the problems. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a physics lesson. <clears throat> if, an, if an object is either not moving or is moving at a constant rate of speed, in other words, there's no acceleration, then the sum of the forces acting on that object are zero. You might recall in one of Newton's laws that we simplify as force equals mass times acceleration. So if there's no acceleration, there can be no force, which means the forces have to add to zero. So here I have a jet fighter traveling this direction. The thrust coming out the engines is pushing it forward. So I have a thrust vector. But we also know that there's air resistance and that's slowing the aircraft down. We call that vector drag. Now, because of the way the wings are designed, we get lift, and then there's also gravity acting on it. If the aircraft is flying straight and level, then these four forces add up to zero. I'm sorry, if it's flying straight and level at a constant speed, then those forces add up to zero. In other words, the sum of the forces will always equal zero for an object that is either still, it's not accelerating, or moving at a constant speed, which means it's not accelerating. One type of problem we'll do is back in the um, early days of flat screen TVs, they were very heavy. And we sometimes would want to hang one from the ceiling. So we'd have a cable here and a cable here, hang it from the ceiling. Nowadays they're so light, you don't even have to do that. But we have the weight here. And if this, if this cable's at 45 degrees and this cable's at 45 degrees, 
how much tension do each of these have to be able to withstand? I mean, if the TV is too heavy, if you put it on a chain or a uh, or a you know twine or something, if the if it's too heavy, it'll snap. So there's a force acting up and to the right here. There's a force acting up and to the left here, and there's a force acting in the downward direction. As long as the TV is not moving, and that's what we want, these three forces have to equal each other. So if this were 100 pounds, this horizontal component and this horizontal component would cancel each other out, so we wouldn't have to worry about that. But I'd have a 50-pound vertical force here, a 50-pound vertical force here, a 100-pound vertical force. I'm sorry in the negative direction. Then what I'd do is I'd have to figure out what is this force here? Well, it would be this, that 50 divided by root two over two, should be 100 root two, 50 root two. So whatever 50 root two is, um, almost 75, that means whatever, substance you're using to hang the TV needs to be able to withstand 75 pounds of tension. Otherwise, it'll snap. And that's my last slide. Nailed it. All right. That's um, chapter six, section six. Have a great day.